questions to the Finance Minister. We now move to questions to the Health Minister. And we start with topical questions. And I call Robin Newton. Mr. Newton. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. I wonder, Mr. Speaker, could I ask the Minister what actions he is currently taking to uh, improve the survival rates of those who are suffering from heart attacks? I uh, thank the member for the question. There are a number of actions that we are taking to improve survival uh, rates from heart attack. Uh, first of all, my Chief Medical Officer is, is devising a community resuscitation strategy uh, to ensure that people are better equipped to respond uh, where heart attack takes place, and especially where there are defibrillators available that they can make uh, full and uh, best use of defibrillators in a safe uh, way. Uh, and very importantly, we have uh, established uh, PCCI units uh, where on a 24-7 basis. So the Belfast PCCI unit at the Royal Victoria Hospital uh, was launched. Uh, that will cover 75% of Northern Ireland's population and uh, will make a massive difference. Uh, uh, the, the other unit will be in Alton Gelvin and it will be in place in the summertime of next year and will cover all of Northern Ireland and will probably offer a service uh, beyond Northern Ireland as well. Uh, and again, uh, we will have 100% coverage for PCCI. The difference that PCCI can make is absolutely fantastic, and we are looking at a reduced mortality rate of around 2%, uh, which will equate to around uh, 20 people actually living as a result of having the PCCI unit in place. But not only will you have 20 people living, every hour that someone, for every hour that, that after a heart attack that someone uh, lives without having such an intervention, uh, they will be doing damage to their, their heart muscle. Mm -hmm. And having the PCCI units in place to respond uh, very, very quickly to the needs of people will ensure that heart muscle uh, isn't damaged and consequently people who suffer from heart attacks uh, and receive uh, PCCI will live considerably longer. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that, and indeed that is uh, good news. Uh, I wonder he, he, uh, what was referred to as the cath labs. I wonder if the Minister might comment on how the cath labs might be rolled out across uh, Northern Ireland. We have a series of cath labs, and the, the PCCI unit, the, the cath labs that I was referring to, uh, would be on a 24-7 basis in Belfast and Alton and Gelvin hospitals. There will be cath labs available in other parts of Northern Ireland, which will not be on a 24-7 basis. Interesting enough, uh, at, at this, how a cath lab works is a very fine wire that is actually uh, pushed through the arteries, uh, <coughs> identify, we identify where the blockage is, and it takes the blockage out. And all it leaves is actually a small mark in, in someone, someone's arm. Um, so it is an intervention uh, which is not a traumatic intervention, uh, but is hugely effective. And uh, I know that our consultants and others are looking at uh, the possibility that at some time they could do it for stroke interventions as well. And that would have a massive impact if we ever got to that point. But at this moment in time, uh, people who suffer from what is described as STEMI heart attacks, in other words, a clot, uh, or which is either a blood clot or, or a piece of fat, which people have generally brought upon themselves through eating the wrong foods. Uh, if that is a, a, in their bloodstream, the, we have the ability to remove that and remove it very effectively if we get the person to the hospital in time. And by do, setting it up in Alton Gelvin and, and Royal Victoria Hospital, we will be able to get people to hospital very, very quickly. Katrina Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And the question I have for the Minister is, um, given the recent report of the College of Emergency Medicine, how will the Minister respond to the recommendations? Yeah, I had a look at the, at the report in the College of Emergency Medicine, and it certainly uh, wasn't the negative report that was reported in the press and media, uh, and it identified that there was a lot of good things happening. Uh, in our emergency departments. W what the report did identify was that right across the United Kingdom, uh, uh, and indeed beyond, but right across the United Kingdom, the, the, there is a problem with getting emergency medicine consultants. And I do think that that's something that the Royal Colleges in particular need to look at as to how we can ensure that there is adequate uh, emergency medicine consultants, registrars and doctors available uh, to carry out the care. Uh, I think that many of the, the things that we have done 
uh, will help us make best use um, of uh, the, the available resources. And certainly, whilst many people criticised us whenever uh, the city hospital uh, closed initially, uh, I think people do recognise that you're better to have your consultants where you have such close, close proximity, uh, based on the one site where they can support each other, provide cover for each other, and ensure that there is adequate cover uh, on a 24/7 basis. Well, the Minister may or may not be aware there's 10 different recommendations. And um, given the 10 recommendations, I wonder would he outline what additional resources, because um, we want to see safety for our patients uh, right across the island of Ireland and indeed in this part of Ireland as well. So could the Minister let me know what additional resources he's going to provide uh, to the hospital to ensure that they can fulfil these recommendations? Well, in, in terms of the, the Belfast Trust uh, Emergency Department, um, attendances, for example, uh, in September uh, 2013 uh, was 7,700. And uh, for those who had to wait for more than 12 hours, uh, that was two people. So we can see that uh, it, it is working uh, quite well in terms of its turnaround. In terms of safety and performance, I think it is recognised that that, that is something uh, which is very good in, in, in the Royal Victoria Hospital, indeed across our hospital sites. Uh, whenever you talk about the resources, we have ensured that we have supported additional nurses um, across the system. We are very keen to support all of the hospitals who are looking for additional consultants, and Alton Gelfin is an area which um, is struggling to get uh, those additional consultants. But nonetheless, we as a department are supporting the trusts in identifying um, consultants. Uh, and having those, those, those people there and having that quality of uh, medical resource uh, to carry out uh, the necessary performance. I think there's actually a lot of good news stories um, on emergency department. I think that Antrim Hospital, uh, whenever I came into office, was constantly in the headlines, and you're not hearing it now, because considerably good work has been done uh, by the people, by the management, by the staff, the doctors, the nurses, and everyone else uh, to ensure that they are turning that facility around and, and using it well. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, can I ask the Minister for an assurance that 5N, the medical assessment unit in the Belfast City Hospital, will remain open and not only that, be also further developed? Well, the medical assessment unit works well in conjunction with the emergency department in the Royal Victoria Hospital. And the medical assessment unit is, enables us to actually take in people. Uh, where the city hospital specialises uh, and, and do that in, in, in a way which uh, is very convenient for, for the public uh, and uh, causes less trauma for the individual who is actually receiving care, and that is important. Uh, so I have not heard anything at the medical assessment doing that there is any threat on it. No one has mentioned that to me. Uh, the member may have heard something different. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, the medical assessment unit is working well and, as, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, will continue to be the case for the future. Anna Lowe. Well, thank the Minister for his assurance. Uh, does the Minister agree that 5N not only provides very necessary rapid targeted early intervention for patients, especially older <laughs> people, but also that it reduces overcrowding? in a and &E in keeping with the aims of trans uh, transforming your care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. D direct admission, obviously, to, to key wards like that they are very, very important. And uh, if GPs can refer people to medical assessment units and avoid emergency departments with uh, all of the others who, who are in those emergency departments, particularly for older people, because, um, as we know, the city hospital does specialise in, in, in urology, for example, an awful lot of older people um, will have infections uh, in their bladders and so forth. And it's very, very important um, that we can treat those people with dignity, with respect. That isn't always the case in the health service, I have to say, but we need to ensure that it is the case um, as, as often as it's possible to be. And I would like it to always be the case that they're treated with respect and dignity. And uh, as, as far as I can see, uh, people who go through that system, through that medical assessment unit um, and into the city hospital, I get very, very positive feedback on that particular facility. Uh, Trevor Long. Mr. Long. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, given his particular responsibilities that he has, does he still hold the view expressed by himself and by other party members that homosexuality is an illness treated by, treatable by 
medical or psychiatric means? I don't think that uh, I ever did say that. Trevor Long. Uh, I'll, I'll try and find a reference for him, but uh, I'll just ask him the same question again. Does he, does he think that homosexuality is an illness treatable by medical or psychiatric means, or does he indeed think that, that as has been expressed by another member of his party, it's actually an abomination? Well, uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, in terms of, of these issues, no, I don't think it is an illness in the first instance. Um, I do think that many people have uh, various uh, elements to their lives um, that, when it comes to sexuality, uh, many people who are heterosexual uh, would desire uh, to, to uh, desire lots of other folks. Those of us, those of us who are married shouldn't, shouldn't be doing that. So uh, people can resist urges. And uh, in terms of all of this, uh, I would just encourage people uh, to take a sensible and rational view on these issues. Uh, I know that there's been a number of challenges about me and about various stances that I take. Uh, I'll make it very clear that in terms of blood safety, um, that is purely about safety. Uh, when it comes to adoption, I'm just coming from a, 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 an MLU, a middle free led unit in Lagan Valley today, and uh, all of the people that were giving birth in that unit were women. And all of, the, all of those women um, would not have been impregnated by another woman. So the natural order, whether one, one believes in God or whether one believes in evolution, the natural order is for a man and a woman to have a child. And therefore, that uh, has uh, made my views on adoption very, very clear and on raising children very, very clear that it should be a man and a woman that raises the child. Now, people can criticise me for that, and they can challenge me for it, and they can say it's backward. Uh, the truth is that still today, in this modern era, it is only a man and a woman that can produce a child. And therefore, I think that it's in the best order for a man and a woman to raise a child. Order, order. Adrian McQuillan. Mr McQuillan. Can I ask the Minister for his assessment of the report by the Economy and Jobs Initiative uh, Task and Finish Group? Yeah, that uh, particular piece of work uh, has, has run on from Connected Health uh, in terms of the work that our department does uh, with the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. Uh, and what we want to do is to ensure that every opportunity is taken uh, to enable us to maximise uh, the, the benefits to our economy. Uh, associated with our health care. So health care accounts for <coughs> around 10% of jobs in Northern Ireland, about 9% of spend in Northern Ireland, and uh, therefore it's very, very important that we identify how best we can use that resource, how we can encourage that resource to be spent max to maximise the spend that actually happens in Northern Ireland uh, in terms of development of drugs, of procedures, uh, the development of innovation. Uh, that, that a lot of that takes place in Northern Ireland. So we have uh, done a lot of work in this. We have established an ecosystem which will involve the universities, the health and social care trusts, uh, and indeed it will involve the business sector. And it is looked upon quite enviously by others, um, lots of other bigger areas. Uh, I'm currently in, in negotiations uh, with the State of New York, for example, uh, on a memorandum of understanding on these issues. Uh, we have got reference three status in the European Union, uh, three star status, which is the highest status that has been awarded uh, thus far. Thirteen countries or regions fitted into it. Northern Ireland is one of those. Uh, and we are making huge progress on this front. And Northern Ireland is being seen as a place, both in Europe and the United States of America, as being hugely progressive. Uh, I think sometimes our media want us to be demonstrated as a place that is backward and regressive whenever actually others are looking to us and saying Northern Ireland is leading the way. Yeah. Members, that concludes topical questions to the Minister of Health. We now move to oral questions to the Minister. And I call Raymond McCartney. And questions yes. number 5, 8, 10 and 15 have all been withdrawn. Mr McCartney. Uh, Kirst Everhain, question number 1. Linda Hunt. Thank you. Elective care is one of three DHSS priorities in the October monitoring round, alongside clinical negligence settlements, TYC transitional funding. For the purposes of the monitoring round process, clinical negligence at 20 million was ranked as the top priority, 
as it is inescapable and therefore has a direct impact on the scope to meet the wider pressure across the HSC in 2013-14. The bid for TYC transitional costs at 18.7 million was ranked second on the basis that it is the most important strategic change programme currently being undertaken within DHS SPS, whilst the bid for elective care was ranked third and is aimed at assisting in addressing backlogs and elective care waiting times across a range of specialities. However, the final prioritisation of bids is ultimately determined by the Executive. When they approved the outcome of each monitoring round, I received some £14 million of my £26 million bid for elective care in the October monitoring round and would intend to resubmit the bid for the remaining £12 million in the January monitoring round. Mr. McCart. Uh, thank you very much, Concord, and can I thank the Minister for his question. Can the Minister short and lighten us as to how perhaps the Executive changed what was his priorities from, as he outlined, from clinical ne negligence, transform your care and elective care, and then it comes out in a, a different order when it comes to uh, resources? Uh, it may be above my pay grade to, to do that. I, I ask for the money and they give it to me. And uh, I, I, I ask it uh, for my priorities, and, and they may see it somewhat differently. And uh, very often that is the case, and it's been the case in other departments that I have been in, and I think it's in the case for other ministers in other departments too. So sometimes what we might see as a priority, uh, others may view differently and, and, and look on it more strategically, in, in, in a sense, and, and think that there is a, a, a wider, wider uh, view can be taken uh, by the executive than perhaps a single department. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister what progress has been made with elective waiting times in his time as Minister? Well, the number waiting, for example, from outpatient appointments has been cut by 4,182 since, since June 2011, uh, with excess waits reduced by 12,277. The number waiting for inpatient admission is down by 7,361 compared with June 2011 with excess weights reduced by 5,936. But I think it's very important that I, that I state here today that we're not complacent, that things are going the right direction, uh, but there's considerably more work to be done. And uh, we have excellent people working within our health and social care trusts and our systems uh, and turning things around very, very well. We need to keep the momentum going, build on the momentum, and ensure that we can continue to reduce waiting times uh, that people should reasonably expect uh, to be seen uh, at a time without having to have excessive weights. Uh, Dominic Bradley. Mr Bradley. Um, can I ask the Minister, Mr Speaker, um, uh, will a community care and treatment centre uh, play a role in providing health care in Newry in the future? Well, in terms of Newry, uh, obviously we have identified that we would support Newry with a, with a proposed a uh, 40 million pound uh, health treatment centre and uh, that is something that uh, has been advertised and we're working on and uh, I know that there has been some degree of reluctance by some of the GPs on that issue and I think that we need to iron that out because if Newry doesn't want to proceed with, with, with that uh, then there are other places that obviously would. Uh, if Newry wants to do something which is a bit different and that may involve um, doing something close to the existing GP site and, and, and I know that there is a, a road service car park close to that site and, and involve us doing uh, a scheme there. Uh, well then that is something that we are happy to look at. Um, we are not uh, interested in imposing solutions on URI, we are interested in, in delivering solutions um, with URI uh, and that is something that we will continue to do. Danny Kenner. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. But in relation to elective care, would he agree that elective treatment using national health service assets in a planned fashion can be better value for money than contracting out health care? Uh, yes, yes, I do. Uh, but in some instances uh, where you don't have the requisite um, consultants or surgeons, um, are we to sit and wait until uh, new people are appointed. Very often the market can be quite limited and therefore appointment process can be quite slow and allow others to wait uh, while that happens. Or will we actually go out and ensure that people get care at the appropriate times? And uh, I am not prepared to say that I will never use the private sector uh, because by using the private sector on occasions 
we can ensure that waiting lists are shorter, that people are not suffering in pain um, for a longer period of time because someone has some um, socialist viewpoint that the private sector is evil and that we can never use it and the public sector is good and we should always use that. I think that we need to be practical and sensible and rational as we move forward and use the services uh, that are best value for money and that can deliver for us at an appropriate time frame. Michaela Boy. Question two. Occupational therapists use a variety of activities and our equipment, for example, specialist seating and wheelchairs and adaptions to enable recovery after illness or injury and to support independent living and health. A number of actions have been taken forward over the last few years to improve waiting times. Um, Standardised access criteria is in place across Northern Ireland to ensure there is a consistent approach across all trusts. The HSCB has commenced a capacity and demand analysis for occupational therapy services within the Western Trust to more clearly understand the reasons for the deterioration in waiting times. In the, in the interim, the HSCB has provided non-recurrent funding to the Western Trust, which is expected to ensure that the current waiting time for assessment is reduced and that by March 2014, no patient will be waiting more than nine weeks for assessment. Can I thank the Minister for his response and welcome the standardisation in terms of the waiting times? Can I also ask the Minister if he can ensure, assure the House that a process will be put in place uh, that ensures report, reports from OTs uh, visits will be speedily uh, completed and forwarded to the appropriate bodies without undue delay? Well, I think occupational therapy is something which is hugely important, and anyone who has had someone uh, you know, that, that they know uh, that have received the services of occupational therapists will recognise how important it is. Many people who uh, need re many people who have suffered from major traumatic incidents in, in, in their health care. Uh, a few years ago, the target for OT waiting time was 26 weeks. Uh, now, it was then reduced to 13 weeks, and I have reduced the waiting time to nine weeks. Yeah. Uh, now, I think that's important that we seek to ensure that we can deliver. In March of this year, there was 127 people who were waiting for more than nine weeks. That is transformationally better than, than it was a few years ago. And I remember as an MLA very often trying to get an OT to come and visit someone who'd had a stroke, um, who had fallen quite ill and, and, and wasn't able to get about uh, as they previously would have and so forth and really needed this and, and, and it was delayed. I am not responsible for other departments. Um, so whenever an OT provides a report for the housing executive, for example, it is for the housing executive to respond to that and respond within uh, an appropriate time frame. I am responsible for trust, so if OTs are referring issues to them and uh, the equipment doesn't come out in time, I, I would certainly be very happy uh, to ensure that, that that was the case, but I don't, don't believe that it is. Brian. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Can I ask the Minister if he can provide us with an update on the implementation of the Allied Health Professionals um, strategy? Uh, thank you, Member, for the question. I launched uh, Northern Ireland's first ever Allied Health Professionals uh, strategy, and a lot of work has taken place in implementing this already. And a good example of the work um, of OTs uh, in, in delivering on the strategy is reablement. And OTs are working in and, in many cases, leading reablement teams in the community. And the reablement model promotes greater independence, it reduces an unnecessary reliance on statutory service. And the ethos of reablement is to provide planned short term care support, which is person centred and promotes independence in personal and domestic activities um, on a daily basis. John Dalt. Uh, Mr Speaker, I thank the Minister for his answer and acknowledge his endeavours to reduce the waiting time for assessment. Does the Minister agree that bed blocking is still an issue and that the time for assessment is contributing to that and hence uh, displacing other patients? Well, I think the issue of bed blocking is considerably improved and has been uh, even predating myself coming in as Minister, but, but uh, it was an issue that, that we all recognised was a problem and I think that the Trusts have been seeking to respond to. So it still may happen on occasions, but I, I think that we are in a considerably better place uh, and in many ways we are envied across the UK because we have a health and social care system which is wholly integrated. Uh, where in England, for example, 
local councils and local authorities look after social services. And the result of that is that people who are getting out of hospital, um, that the council very often don't facilitate things as quickly as they should because the cost burden comes on to them. With us having an integrated system, uh, there is not the same issue whenever it comes to the cost being transferred. And of course, it's hugely beneficial um, to get people out of hospital at the appropriate time, both for the individual and indeed for the hospital. So bed blocking uh, is not the issue that it was a few years ago. Uh, I suspect that there may be on occasions that, that it still happens, uh, but I think that the system works uh, relatively efficiently. Order members, question number three, Mr. Wells. Jim Wells is not in his place. Katrina Ryan. question number four, Lady Hull. As the member will be aware, in an oral statement to the House on the 5th of November, I announced the appointment of Professor Kathleen Marshall to lead the inquiry into child sexual exploitation. I also informed the members that, as normal practice, Professor Marshall was given the opportunity to shape and agree the final terms of reference for the inquiry. As agreed, the inquiry will seek to establish the nature of child sexual exploitation in Northern Ireland and measure the extent to which it occurs, examine the, infect the effectiveness of the current cross-sectoral child safeguarding and protection arrangements, and measures to prevent and tackle child sexual exploitation make recommendations on the future actions required to prevent and tackle child sexual exploitation and who should be responsible for those actions, and report the findings of the inquiry within one year of its commencement. In addition, the inquiry should consider specific safeguarding and protection issues for looked after children, taking into account the ongoing thematic review by the Safeguarding Board for Northern Ireland. Seek the views of children and young people in Northern Ireland and other key stakeholders, and engage with parents to identify the issues they are facing and seek their views on what needs to be done to help them keep their children safe from the risk of child sexual exploitation. The inquiry will not focus on the circumstances or on our responses to the 22 children who are part of the ongoing police investigation known as Operation Isle. This will be a focus of the separate thematic review being undertaken by the SBNI. However, available learning generated from this review will be taken into account by the inquiry. Katrina I thank the Minister for his answer. It's unfortunate that he, he didn't uh, go to the, uh, his committee in relation b before coming to this House. But what guarantees, because if he did, he may have learnt something and we may have a better inquiry. But what guarantees can the Minister give to assure the House that this inquiry will be more than a report? Well, in terms of it, there is obviously two. There is actually three inquiries. There is a police investigation happening, uh, and that is important that they conduct their, their course of work. There is a thematic inquiry into the 22 cases. Uh, the inquiry that I have launched uh, will be one that, that uh, looks at the overall scenario, uh, how potentially we can do things better. Uh, we will be looking at policy. And uh, I think that, uh, well, maybe I would have learned something from the committee. Uh, I think uh, the member may think that the former Scottish Commissioner uh, for, for Children's Health, an eminent professor, uh, someone who is hugely qualified to conduct this work and to carry it out, she maybe thinks that um, she might need to learn something too. I actually think that Professor Marshall is very well placed to conduct this inquiry and is a very knowledgeable individual and, 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 and has the skills and requisite skills uh, to actually identify the issues that we should be looking at in an inquiry. And I do tend to, to take a, a lot of cognizance of, of what she might have to say. Gregory Campbell. Mr Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, because, obviously, of the land border between Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic, um, can the Minister outline what steps might be taken in the future uh, regarding uh, child sexual exploitation that would occur on a cross-border basis uh, in order to try and ensure that it is prevented insofar as possible? Of course, uh, predators um, don't recognise borders uh, uh, as, as something to block them. In fact, they will very often use borders as something to assist them. And, and that is very important that, that, that we, we are aware of that and that we work closely with our, 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 our colleagues in the Republic of Ireland to ensure uh, that the border does not become uh, a barrier to child protection. We have a cross-border work programme. Um, and that was taken forward by a cross-border steering group on child protection, which was agreed in July 2012. It has identified key areas in which together our respective jurisdictions can continue to make significant progress over the next few years. 
The work programme is to promote shared learning and contribute further to improving practice in specific areas of safeguarding and child protection, focusing on five work streams. We have an all exchange forum, uh, which will promote continued learning through the use of research and evidence based practice. Uh, work stream two is quality and effectiveness. We will progress initiatives to build workforce capacity and improve the quality and effectiveness of social work and social care work interventions and practice. Work team three deals with the deaths of children in care, contributing to learning in relation to the deaths of children in care by developing an overview and analysis of the futures of death of children in care in both jurisdictions. Work stream four is cultural competence and safeguarding and will assist to develop common guidance for practitioners working with other cultures. And work team five deals with specialist services, exploring opportunities to develop cross border specialisms. Um, so there's clearly a course of work that has been done. We've seen evidence in recent days of those who have sought to use a border uh, to evade uh, being brought forward uh, for prosecution. Uh, I'm glad that that, that was overcome and that recently someone has been prosecuted um, for that very uh, action. Fergal McKinney. Mr. McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his replies thus far? While these inquiries are taking place, what processes are being put in place in the interim to ensure that children in care are appropriately looked after and not put in, in vulnerable positions? Well, uh, in, the, the children are being looked after, and, and as far as possible, um, the staff in our residential care homes will seek to ensure they are not put into vulnerable positions. Um, some of the children uh, w will believe that they are in, in, in a loving relationship. Uh, I believe sometimes that is misplaced, but uh, in some instances it may be a 16-year-old with a 19-year-old, so try to convince them that, that it is anything other than uh, their boyfriend and so forth, uh, but it is still wrong. Uh, so we need to try to assist <coughs> the, the young people in terms of their learning, in terms of their knowledge, in terms of risks that, that, that may be brought upon them. Uh, there is much more serious stuff out there as well, where children may be going to party houses, and where there is high levels of abuse taking place in those party houses. Uh, something that I think uh, the majority of people in this house, if not all, all of this house, would find um, wholly repellent. And we need to ensure that, that we protect children as far as possible from those circumstances. Uh, in terms of, of the inquiry, if there is learning um, becomes obvious to us. During the course of the inquiry, we will not wait to the end of the inquiry to implement it. Implementation will take place immediately uh, where advice is given to us that we should be changing procedures for the benefit of children. Roy Banks. Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In your statement on child sexual exploitation in September, you indicated that you were open to the involvement of the Education and Training Inspectorate for the benefit of, of children and their protection. Uh, given the apparently dysfunctional relationship between yourself and the Education Minister, what makes you so confident that he will uh, approve the Educational and Training Inspectorate to work with the inquiry? Well, the, the Educational Training Inspectorate actually helped us draw up the guidelines, and uh, what makes me confident is that uh, Minister O'Dowd told me he would. <laughs> Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number six. I met with the Republic of Ireland's Minister for Health, Dr James Riley, TD, on 12 September 2013 to continue my discussions on the potential for a two-centre model, potentially providing PCCS services in Belfast and Dublin. <coughs> Consideration of this proposal is continuing at an official level to determine whether such a model would be feasible, and I will inform the Assembly of the outcome and announce my decision in the future commissioning of this service, which I hope to do as soon as possible. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister accept that now, more than a year since restrictions were placed on children's heart surgery in Belfast, that the lack of clarity and the ongoing delay of outcome causes increasing distress for families? And can he give us a more uh, concrete time scale for completion of this review? And indeed, does he accept that an all Ireland network of children's heart surgery with a footprint in Belfast is what is needed? Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I do accept that uh, the, the delay is undesirable, um, and I do accept that the delay causes further consternation to families, and that's not what we wish to have. Uh, however, uh, I need people to cooperate with me. I need people to, <coughs> to be agreeable to, to what we in this House actually, actually want, and uh, that is what we have been working on, and uh, that is a course of work that will have to be uh, seen through if, if we are to be successful. 
And uh, I would just urge people uh, to be uh, patient a little longer. Uh, time is of the essence. Professor Woods leaves his role uh, in December. Uh, so we will need to have uh, something in place uh, before that happens. And that is a course of work that, 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 that we're continuing uh, to engage upon. Uh, so I would hope to be in a position to, to you know, give this House um, a, a full update uh, in the not too distant future, uh, bearing in mind that we are uh, losing one of our surgeons in December. McRae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Minister will be aware of um, joint services such as those that operate in um, Toronto and Ottawa and other parts of North America. Um, has he given any consideration as to how that type of model could work in respect of how um, the services are delivered in Northern Ireland and the Irish Republic? Uh, we have, and uh, Minister Riley and myself agreed that we would look for some international expertise that could give us advice on this issue. Uh, recently, on a trip to Boston, uh, I met uh, a, a, a eminent uh, surgeon uh, whose responsible, uh, who's overall responsibility for around 1,000 procedures taking place in, in his own hospital. Uh, and uh, we are looking at, at uh, seeking his help um, jointly uh, to give us advice and, and to provide advice uh, to the clinicians on this issue as to how best we can continue to support uh, the, the children in Northern Ireland uh, who, require, who require congenital cardiac surgery. And uh, I think that that has the potential to be a significant advance forward. Conor McKevitt. Mr Speaker, um, can I ask the Minister, the new um, funding announced by the Minister of Finance recently uh, for the new Children's Hospital, do you think that will change the context um, of this debate? Uh, no. I think that uh, we will be able to um, provide a, a better facility for people to be cured in. Uh, but at this moment in time, the care that has been received, uh, certainly in the cardiology and is absolutely world-class and second to none. Uh, the care that has been provided in the surgical side, again, is a very safe service, and uh, <coughs> we would want to ensure uh, that we can continue to provide the full cardiology service and continue to provide a surgical service uh, in Belfast. Pat Sheehan. Mr. Sheehan. Kian Korla, Kaist, over a shock. Question seven, please. Uh, the future provision of Children's Heart Service at the New Children's Hospital is a matter for the Belfast Health and Social Care Trust in conjunction with the Health and Social Care Board. However, I can advise that the New Children's Hospital has been sized to accommodate Children's Heart Services, and it is the intention that all pedi pediatric cardiology services currently provided in the Royal Belfast Hospital for sick children will be provided in the New Children's Hospital. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. I am just wondering if the Minister can provide us with clarity around a timeline for uh, a decision around Children's Heart Services. Well, I, I think that the clarity is that a timeline has to be, has to be delivered um, you know, uh, b before the end of December. Uh, so certainly I will be bringing something to the House in this term uh, to make very clear as to how we are proceeding. Um, with uh, congenital cardiac care. I, I should say that I am absolutely delighted at the, the, the funding that is coming from the, the Minister of Finance um, for the Children's Hospital. Uh, it is something that I have been working on over the last two and a half years consistently. Uh, it is not a, a facility that is as good as we would like it to be in terms of the care that is being provided for our children and young people. And, uh, whenever I took them down there, uh, I, I, he had the same reaction uh, and, and has uh, supported the proposal. So yeah, yeah. I, I was criticised some time ago for, for saying that roads was not as big a priority as other things. And I know that Mr. Alistair and others criticised me for that. This here, I believe, is the number one priority yeah, for capital yeah. spending in Northern Ireland. It should be the number one priority because yeah. it is wrong that children are being cared for in a facility which is wholly substandard in terms of its physical capacity. Uh, and I am delighted that we have been able to respond very positively on this front. 
Uh, Trevor Clark. Mr. Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I thank the Minister for his questions thus far also? And uh, I'm pleased to say that I'm he hearing today in terms of the paediatric services are going to be re retained in Belfast. But could the Minister maybe outline more in relation to the business case around the new hospital in Belfast? Well, the Belfast Trust has developed a, an outline business case for the construction of a new 155-bed regional children's hospital. And in addition to the services currently provided in, in the, the current uh, sick children's hospital, bed and theatre modelling for a new hospital also includes provision for services up to 16 years of age, with flexibility to increase this to 18 as the outcome of the review of paediatric services recommends. Activity currently undertaken outside RH, RBHSC and activity currently transferred to other facilities because of insufficient capacity at the Belfast Hospital for Sick Children. In, in addition to the, the enabling works and decants to facilitate the development of the hospital, site infrastructural updates, including an energy centre, are required. Existing facilities, as I said, are, are, are cramped. They're, they're unfit uh, in terms of uh, delivering the health care in the 21st century. And I think that it is absolutely critically important that we do all of these things. Currently, a lot of young people, whenever they become teenagers, are transferred to adult hospitals. So you can have 14 and 15 year olds uh, lying side by side with, 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 with very elderly people. It's not a good mix for either the young person or indeed for the older person. So actually expanding and extending the service uh, that has been offered at the Children's Hospital is something which I would uh, believe would be very positively received. Sam Gardner. Mr. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, certainly my party would warmly welcome the announcement the Minister has said in relation to the Children's Hospital. But could I push you a wee bit further, Minister, and tell us when is it going into operation? How would we wait this year, next year, or the following year? Yes, uh, that's, a, that's a very good question, Mr. Gardner. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, in, in, in terms of this, uh, by the time we go through all of the processes, uh, engage in decant demolition because it's going to have to be rebuilt on the existing site uh, and the actual uh, development and commissioning of the facility, uh, it will be 2019. Now, that is something that I would like to be shorter, uh, but it's a reality that I have to accept. Um, so it is all the more important and incumbent upon us to get this announcement out here uh, and that we develop the funding, funding cycles to ensure that the, the, all of the funding is available. Uh, Minister Hamilton has uh, made the initial $15.5 million available. Um, that gives us the basis to, to, to move forward um, to complete um, all of the consultancy work that will take place beforehand um, and to allow us to start the programme uh, that will ensure that we have a state-of-the-art uh, children's hospital that we in Northern Ireland can be proud of. Yeah. Anna Lowe. Number nine. Thank you. I am aware of the interest the member has in this area, and I thank her for responding to the Department's consultation on the draft guidance. I would remind the member that the law in Northern Ireland does not address the, address the issue of lethal fetal abnormality. This is very clearly a difficult area, and we must fully support our health staff. However, they can only act within the law, and ultimately only the executive and this assembly can change the law. My views on the issue are well known. I am opposed to the liberalisation of the law. But I will consider any proposals uh, that are put uh, forward by the Minister of Justice that seek to address some of the issues that have recently come to the fore. As the Member is aware, the position on the termination of pregnancy in Northern Ireland is provided for in the body of the criminal law, as it has been interpreted in the courts. Any guidance to the document produced by my department can only reflect existing law. It cannot change it. The recent consultation has been successful and highlighting the concerns of health professionals and others have in relation to this sensitive issue. And I have asked officials to consider all of the consultation responses with the aim of producing a document capable of supporting our health staff as they deal every day with difficult issues faced by women and their families, often in very tragic circumstances. That concludes question time. A point of order, Mr Wells. I think uh, sackcloth and ashes are in order. I uh, inadvertently missed my question to the Minister of Health. Um, my only feeble excuse is that his productivity is much higher than other ministers, and he was getting through the questions much faster, but I realise that I should have been in here for the start of question time. I want to say I want to appreciate Mr Wells coming to the House very quickly and apologising to the House.